to welcome Casey Gray and introduce her um, to the audience. Uh, Casey did her PhD in Edinburgh and she did eight years in Marseille with Bootsma and others on perception action. She is now in Belfast, Queen's University. She's a director there for, as you can see, the Movement Innovation Lab. And she's also a dean for postgraduate studies. And uh, if you look at her homepage, it's amazing how much she has achieved. I will not list all the projects, papers, and awards, but you may know that the European Union has a European Research Council, and she was one of the young investigators, gave a two million grant, and built up her research profile in perception action. And as you can see, a lot of, of new technology. She will talk about virtual reality technology in sports today. And further, she does a lot of, of interdisciplinary work, so integrating aging, Parkinson, movement analysis with psychology. And she is in an um, institute and school of behavioral sciences within psychology. She does a lot of work that connects areas. Her movement analysis and virtual reality are well known. And if you look at her uh, footprints on her research um, system, you will see a lot of projects that are wonderful and exciting. Uh, for example, she does a lot of auditory information. Most people in perception action look only on vision. That is very interesting. One of the projects, by the way, is listed to run until 2099. I think that is an issue of the system. But if it's true that you have funding until 2099, you should tell the audience how and how you do the final report of it. Yeah. Okay. So I'm very looking forward for her talk, and I think it will be an eye-opening talk about new technology, how can we use it in sports, and please help me to welcome Casey. Okay, thank you very much, and um, thank you very much to FETSAC and to BASES as well. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today to talk to you about my work. Um, the focus of my talk today is very much around the use of technology in sport. Um, yesterday we heard Angus talk about his role at the Blue Jays, he talked about a lot of data that now exists in sport. So I suppose today my sort of call really is that as psychologists, as sports scientists, what we really should be asking is what does that data mean and what does it tell us about behaviour? So my talk today is really trying to understand, use technology to tell us something a little bit more about behaviour. So my work, it's not just me, um, I've had the privilege to work with many great people um, over the years now, too many years to, 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 to think of. Um, I was in Marseille and that's where I worked with Reinhard Bootsma and Eric Berton, Guillaume Raoult. Some of the work I'm presenting today on the curve free kicks in soccer started way back in 2000. Also worked with Sebastian Bro, Benoit Bido, and Michel Krupa at the University of Rennes too. And also more recently with Van der Correa, Duarte as well in Lisbon. And my own PhD students at Queen's in Belfast. As Marcus said, I was very lucky to get some ERC funding, which was absolutely fantastic and gave me the opportunity to really explore this area and do more in that space. I've also worked with Adidas in terms of product development and looking at some things there. Ulster Rugby, English Cricket Board more recently, and Cricket Ireland, trying to take this technology to a new level so it will have an applied aspect as well. So today's talk, I've divided it into different sections. The first bit, I'm going to define what I mean by decision making, because it's a term that we hear used all the time, and particularly for psychologists, I've got colleagues in Belfast who talk about decision making very much in a, in a different aspect, in a different context. For me, it's about action-based decisions and very much the type of decisions that we make in sport. Having this perception action background, I'm very interested in understanding how those decisions are made. What is it that influences decision making? And you'll see for me, I think one of the key things is perception and the role of information we pick up through our senses. And then I'm going to move into the methodology. How do we study decision making? Look at two examples, within <coughs> soccer, football and rugby. And finally, I'm going to go into that space of where I see opportunities are now to use this technology, which I think to, to improve decision making and push the field and the frontiers further forward. So decision making for me is really these action based decisions and they're things we make thousands of times a day without thinking twice. 
when we're driving a car, for example, we're continually making decisions about what we do next. Braking, accelerating, indicating, turning. Even crossing a road. There we're going to be sampling our environment, making a decision that can cross between these two cars. But for me, the three pillars of decision making where we should really be focusing our analysis on is on the what, when, and how. There's a lot of focus on the what, but for me, the timing, when you do it with respect to what's happening around you, and then how you do it, the skill aspect, is very important to consider as well. So we look at sports psychology and we look at decision making. I've heard some talks this morning talking about that. It's been very heavily influenced by a lot of the work that was done in the 60s and 70s. And there it was around expertise. It was trying to understand how do people make these decisions. Some of the paradigms that were using, used in those instances were chess players, grand masters of chess. So what they were able to see was that players could look ahead, they could use their game knowledge to plan what it was they were going to do next. They could also recognise these patterns of play. So they could plan six, seven, eight moves ahead, they could chunk information, and they could make predictions about what's going to happen. But if you think about it, what happens on a chessboard is very different to what happens on a pitch. There, on a chessboard, you have pieces that can only move in certain ways. You don't have the same temporal constraints that you have on the pitch. And of course, you've got some pieces that can only move in certain directions. And for me, this type of approach can't explain what we see in this video. We can't explain how players can do the unexpected and perform things under very tight time constraints and adapt to something that they have never seen before. So for me, it can't explain novelty, something you've never seen before. No two situations are ever the same in sport. It can't explain these special temporal constraints, how you can act in the moment, how you know when it is you're supposed to act. And we heard yesterday as well, people alluding to the importance of team dynamics. Absolutely. How do you understand? How do you read? what your fellow teammate is going to do next. For me, one of the key aspects here is really this notion of anticipation. So I think this quote by Wayne Gretzky, I'm trying to understand what makes a player great, summed up very nicely in this quote. He says, a good hockey player plays where the puck is, but a great hockey player plays where the puck is going to be. And if you've heard Ronaldo talk recently about his performance and how he thinks he's evolved as a player, he says he runs less, but he feels that he plays smarter. He waits, he reads, he anticipates. He doesn't need to run round as much, but he can time <coughs> his run and be much more incisive in his decision making. So how do you anticipate where the ball's going to go, where the puck's going to go? How do you play ahead of time? For me, this is where perception and information comes in. So if you think about it, it's our senses that connect us to the outside world. If we couldn't see, hear, touch, feel, it would be an awful situation to be in. It would be like living in a black box. And of course, we've got proprioception, our sixth sense as well, that's really telling where our body is orient orientated in space. And these senses provide us with that link to the surrounding environment. I'm sure many of you have had a cup of coffee this morning. I know there's the coffee machines out there. And if you think about it, there's all these different sources of energy there. There's light, there's sound, there's also the, the smell, and then eventually, of course, the taste and the touch of it when you actually drink your cup of coffee. And if you think about that, those are different <coughs> sources of energy, but what our senses can actually do is capture that energy translate it into a neural code and transmit it to the brain. So it's absolutely fascinating what the brain can actually do. So these senses act as transducers, translating the physical energy into this common neural code that the brain understands. So a signal that all the different parts of the brain bring together. So that notion of connection with our, our outside environment is a very important one for me and one that I think holds the key to our understanding of decision making. So J.J. Gibson, who was a, a, a postdoc mentor of my PhD supervisor, who was David Lee, 
He was the one who started to challenge the approach to perception. He said, you know, there's a lot of this stuff around representation, a lot of this stuff around what's in the environment's inaccurate and the brain has to construct and compute everything. He said, ask not what's inside your head, but what your head is inside of. In other words, you're interacting with an environment around you. What is that information you have with your interaction? And a lot of Gibson's work started out with working with pilots in World War II. He was trying to get them to land planes better with limited information. And he was very interested on the information you would get through landing on the ground. So this ground theory. So as you approach a runway, that flow of information you can pick up on the back of your eye. So he also talked about this importance of perceive to move and move to perceive. And we know in sport how important that is. You're never standing still. You're constantly surveying what's happening around you. And this little diagram here shows nicely that change in information when you move. So we can see the person sitting at the chair, the solid line showing what they can see. And when they stand up, their perspective is different. So for me, what the person sees from their viewpoint is very important when we're trying to understand decision making in sports. You can all see me, I can see you. Our perspectives are different. We all know we're in this amphitheater, but the information you have available to you is really very different. So if we go back to the real world and we think of the driving example here, what you can see is that this person has to act ahead of time. The car is stopped in front of them and they break as they approach the car. So I was speaking to somebody from Perform Better yesterday and they were talking about these light boxes. That is my pet hate because for me, decision making is not stimulus response. It is not about being reactive. It's about being proactive and controlling your movements prospectively. It's not how quickly you can move, it's as long as you're moving at the right time with the information you have available to you. So for example here, the driver doesn't slam on the brakes at the last minute. They have to be able to control and regulate their action as they approach the car in front. So it's my PhD supervisor, Professor David Lee, who came up with this notion of trying to understand what could be the information our senses could pick up that could allow us to prospectively control our action. So if you think about it in terms of physical attributes, when you're approaching a stop sign or a car in front, there's the distance between where you are and where the stop sign is, and you're traveling at a certain speed. But what Dave said was, no, we don't need to calculate distance and speed. What we have available to us is what's presented on the back of the eye, the optical angle. So that angle theta that you see here will change over time as you approach the stop sign. So if you hold out your hand in front of you and as it comes closer to your eyes, the size of your hand is changing with the approach. You don't think, oh, my hand's getting bigger. You know that the hand is getting closer to you. So the way that those angles change over time can give us information that can allow us to anticipate and allow us to know what will happen in what we call the current future. In the next one or two seconds, if I don't start to break now, I'm going to collide with the car in front. So I need to do something. So I talk about this temporal bubble within which we operate, and it's very true for sport. <coughs> so, of course, the decision-making is more complex than the simple perception action. We're all individuals, we're all unique. And for me, it's about this ability to detect the information. For example, the looming, whatever it is that we're interested in, the bodily movement of somebody. But it's also the action capabilities of the person who's actually moving. And this is where skill comes in. This is where strength and conditioning comes in. This ability to act as fast as you can. So the player, the goalkeeper coming off the line, anticipating where the ball's gonna go. And that decision making is going to be dependent on those. If you want, it's the affordance. The affordance is almost about the decision that is made by the person. And it's unique to an individual. And this decision making can also change during a game. As the action capabilities change, as you get tired, 
If you get injured, that's going to impact on the decisions that you make too. The what you do, when you do it, and how you do it. So that's to give you a little bit of a flavour of the theoretical background and where I'm coming from when I'm looking at decision making and trying to understand what it is that players actually do on the pitch. So Angus mentioned yesterday that they have so much data as soon as the, bat, the ball leaves the bat. For me, I'm really interested in how does the bat make contact with the ball. If you look at what we have in sport, we have a lot of so-called performance data. Lots of GPS telling us statistics relating to how the player moved, how many meters per second, how many kilometers they ran, how many impact collisions they had. But what does that really tell us about performance? Does it really tell us something about decision making? It doesn't really. We don't have the context. We don't know under which context those decisions or those movements were actually made. If we look at performance analysis, there, we've got more or less a frequency of the when or how many decisions were made, how many tackles were made, how many shots on goal were made. So you've really got a description of what happened in the game, but nothing about when, nothing about how, nothing about how impactful those decisions really were. So if we're trying to study this as a psychologist, we need a robust methodology that will allow us to try and understand and measure that behaviour. So when I look back at what colleagues have used, we were limited to what we had available at the time. So I was in Marseille and I was trying to find a way of looking at discur-free kicks in soccer. I turned first to video, but then very quickly realised that no two free kicks were ever the same. I couldn't present the information from the perspective of the goalkeeper and it was all wrong in terms of the presentation of the information. It does not represent the player's viewpoint. And as I said to you earlier, what you see, your eyes see at that moment and your position in space is extremely important when you're coming to make a decision. And furthermore, if you look at this and you say, where would you play the ball? You don't have the space time pressures of the game. How many times, of those of you who play sport, have you maybe been in a situation where you said, oh, I should have passed, should have, would have, could have. All of these situations where you missed that window of opportunity in which to act. So for me, replicating space time pressures to understand decision making is extremely important. There have been attempts to, to, to do this from the player's viewpoint. GoPro cameras, for example. But anybody that's looked at GoPro footage you know how difficult that is. It does represent the viewpoint of the player, but it only replays that action, and it's extremely jittery because it's incorporating the movement of that player as well. So this didn't really help me. I was trying to find a way to study decision-making, but study decision-making where the behaviors I would see in my task resembled more the behaviors that you see on the pitch. And Gibson talked about this laboratory must be like life. And in psychology, we've also got this notion of representative design way back from Brunswick in the 1950s. And it's that importance of having participants behaving in your task as they would in the real world. Otherwise, how can we extrapolate from one to the other? So for me, this behavioral realism is really extremely important. So this is really where the virtual reality technology came in. So at the time, I was dealing with pretty old headsets, but the really exciting bit about these headsets were they had a sensor in the back. This meant if I turned to look to my left or look to my right, the computer would render or display what I would see in the real world if I was turning to look around. I can only see the doors when I point my head there. I can't see the rest of the space. So it was a really nice tool to allow me to try and recreate this perception, action, look. So this immersive interactive virtual reality is very much trying to control what the person sees inside the headset, but also hears. The sound is a very, very important as well. And then measure what, when, and how the person responds 
to this information that you're presenting. So you can control the information and then measure in real time what the person's doing. That really acting in the moment piece. And of course then your software, which is now quite sophisticated, at the time it wasn't, um, allows you to tie that all together. So this 360 degree immersion, this is an older version of the headset, so this is Gareth wearing the headset. And you see what I mean, this looking around your environment. So no matter where you look, you're totally immersed in that virtual environment and everything you see is within that. So why use virtual reality? Well for me, I've mentioned it already, the player viewpoint, that egocentric viewpoint, so that the information presented in the back of your eyes is the information you would get as if you were in the game. This realistic event dynamics is very important as well and I'll come back to it towards the end of the talk. It's very much about the fidelity of the content. And by that I mean what you're presenting needs to have the spatial temporal dynamics of what happened in the real life. Whether that's ball movement, whether it's player movement, whatever it is needs to represent that time frame and the way it moved in real life. It's obviously a 3D presentation, which is much more powerful than a 2D presentation. You've got the motion parallax, so you move to perceive, you perceive to move. You can choose where it is you look. Being a psychologist, we love to control our variables, so you can of course systematically manipulate and control the variables that you present, but very importantly you can measure those behavioural responses and you can put it back in context. So you know what was happening when that person <coughs> decided to move. So I'm just going to give you a couple of brief examples and I'm going to sort of then show this type of analysis that we do of the movement because for me that's the critically important thing and that I suppose that is our, our, our unique selling point from a psychologist perspective and understanding what's really going on inside the head. So this started way back when I, as I said when I was in Marseille just around the time of the World Cup and maybe some of you remember this free kick by Roberto Carlos where it bends way out to the right and at the last minute it goes back in. Now what was interesting for me was why did Bartes not move and why did that ball boy move to the left? People in the crowd as well ducked. It seemed that people, a lot of people thought the ball was going wide, it seemed that it was difficult to judge and my question as a psychologist was why? So you had physicists modelling this in terms of the trajectory but for me the question was why is it difficult for the brain, is it difficult for the brain to judge this and if so why? So I turned to VR because doing this in everyday life, ideally if we could do it in the field, we would, but you can't reproduce the same free kick with the same amount of spin over and over again. And we also wanted to have the same free kick for successive goalkeepers. And we can't do that when we are doing it in real life. I wanted to include this because this is just an example of one of the conditions it's the same departure point here, but three different types of spin. NS is no spin, CCS is counterclockwise spin, and CS is clockwise spin. So what I was manipulating was spin. Look how different. This is the same departure position, and these balls ultimately would arrive at the same position in the goal mouth. But you can see that in terms of information there, it's very different. So as the event unfolds, those optical angles are all very different. So that's what I was interested in. How, as this trajectory changes over time, does that influence the decisions made by the goalkeeper? So this is an older version, what we used in the actual study. Now the graphics we have are much better. Um, so you see that's again looking around, you're facing the goalkeeper, you can move around, you can go and touch the posts. And this animation of the hands is extremely important. All they are are hands, there's no arms, nothing. But what you have is your trackers on the back of the hands. As you turn your hands, you can see them moving in the virtual world. And that's really important for this behavioral realism because you've got the proprioceptive information from your arms saying, oh, I'm controlling these. So you get buy-in into that virtual space a lot more. And plus, these hands are what's move, what are moving to block the ball. 
just an example of one coming in. And what we were measuring is how do these hands move as the ball comes towards you. So I basically wanted to know what, why is this player moving here and then realizing they've gone the wrong way and coming back. So when and how does a goalkeeper decide to act based on what it is they see? This is an example in uh, the older lab that we had, and you've got two participants, one novice and one expert. And what the difference here is, if you think this is them in a, in a lab, what's controlling their movements is what they see inside the headset. So I think you'll probably be able to spot who do you think is the expert? Yeah, the guy on the right. So it's a nice example, I think, to show the action capabilities. So they're presented with the same thing. The guy on the left is a Sunday goalkeeper, and the guy on the right is an international player from Northern Ireland. So you can see the difference in the skill even as they move through that. So not surprisingly, when we looked at the what, so how successful were they, how many saves did they make, our international player that we just saw there was pretty successful. So he was still able to stop some of those balls were spin at, on them. But I wanted to understand, okay, they're better, very good, not highly surprising, but why are they better? And I suppose I wanted to understand why this expert goalkeeper at under 18 level wasn't as good as this player here. What did they do differently? And that's where the analysis really comes into play. So this is quite a busy little diagram, but bear with me. So these are two different departure positions arriving in the central position in the goal. We also had different arrival positions along this, but I only want to show this to illustrate the point. So orange is our counterclockwise spin, bending to the left and coming back in. CS is our clockwise spin, bending to the right and coming back in. And the blue is no spin, okay? So it's just coming straight at you. So this is the perceptual piece. I then wanted to measure this action, so this was with Joost Dessing. We were really trying to understand how is this information influencing the action choices of the player. So this is our little player, this is distance, left and right, and this is time. So what you see here is, with the orange, remember they're arriving at the same point, what you see with this <coughs> orange one is what we saw in the video. As the ball bends to the left, the player's hand movements go to the left and then they're going, oh, oh, I'm a bit far away from the ball and they miss it. In the pink, it's the opposite direction. And the blue, they just move the hand straight up because the ball is arriving there. So there's no effect of spin there. Now that movement in the wrong direction when we did the analysis of each individual player, what we find was that our junior goalkeeper, so this was another one who was under 16, what you find there is that this error is much bigger because they're moving in the wrong direction. So if the final error is greater, it means they're missing those balls. Whereas our senior goalkeeper is making less movements in the wrong direction, so his final error is less, meaning that he's more successful. So I suppose to summarize this bit, what we were able to show is that yes, goalkeepers are fooled by spin, but that the, and the brain isn't adapted to anticipate the consequences of it, but that the experts can moderate the effects of spin by waiting longer. So here's an example of faster isn't better. It's about waiting longer, picking up more information, and then having the action capabilities and the skill to cover the distance that you actually need to get there. So those action capabilities are really important. So, Another use of this technology and, what, and where we've been using it was with product design. So Adidas Innovation Team Football came to see us in Belfast after the catastrophic Jabalani ball. Um, I don't know if you remember, that's the one everybody complained about because it was fluttering and it was moving. Players and goalkeepers, everybody hated this ball. Now, the engineers were saying, oh, it's a triangle. These designers, they put a triangle on a sphere and if you spin the ball around its axis, the triangle gives this visual illusion that the ball's moving. But they had also changed their manufacturing techniques, so there were fewer panels on the ball, which was affecting the aerodynamics. So 
So they had the x, y, z coordinates of the ball with this flutter, which was that instability as it moved through the air. So what we were able to show was that actually we were able to put people in a virtual environment, we were able to show them balls with and without this design, and with and without the flutter. And by controlling that, we were able to show actually it's a combination of both the design and that flutter is impacting on their ability to make decisions about what to do next. So it was affecting their performance. So I was pleased to say that the brazooka ball that they had, they changed the type of dynamics and they also changed the number of panels that they had in the ball so that the ball flight was much more stable. So the next example is slightly different. It's still to do with deception, but this, in, in this case, it's about sidestep movements and it's about deceptive movement. So if you think about sport, a lot of things that we do is trying to deceive an opponent to get a competitive edge. And I suppose movement is no different to what we do with, say, a ball in tennis or in soccer. So here's an example of Quinn Cooper, who's one of the best steppers there is. So you can see that he steps here, sends number 14 the wrong way, steps again, and sends number 9 the wrong way. So with my colleagues in Rennes, in France, Seb's PhD was really trying to understand what is it that makes somebody um, believe they're going one direction when they really end up going the other. In other words, how do you signal deception to an opponent? So using motion capture, you're able to capture these real one-on-one -on -one interactions, and that was really important. It's not stepping a cone. In this case, you're actually up against a real opponent. And what was nice was we were able to gauge how successful the movement was by measuring the movement of the defender. So how much did they move in the wrong direction? So Seb's analysis, taking the different body points and trying to understand how do you signal deception, really showed that it could be divided into deceptive and honest signals. And this isn't very surprising when you think about it. The centre of mass has to be an honest signal. Why? Because you have to keep it close to the centre because you're trying to change direction. However, the extremities, the outfoot, the head, the shoulders, you can move in the opposite direction. So you can exaggerate those compared to the centre of mass that you have to minimise. So without going into the details, our perceptual analysis here was able to allow us to show that experts use these honest signals, so they're tuning into or attending to information in different places, whereas the novices are using these deceptive signals. And to do that, we had a perception-only experiment with different temporal occlusion paradigms that some of you will be familiar with, and we were able to show that with more information what they were able to do. So this was time zero, time one, time two, and time three, so 100 milliseconds later. You're able to see the novices are still pretty poor at time one, but our experts have that advantage. And if we also were able to do that again, oops. <laughs> It's not going to do it. So I have like a, an example of how we were able to profile for each player as well how good they were. And what we found was that some of the players, we did this with Ulster Rugby, and we were able to profile all their um, top, top level players. And what we were able to see was that those players that play heads up rugby, who look at what's happening around them, tended to do the best in this. So one of the players that I wanted to show you there actually hits 100% here and is 100% the whole way across. So again, it's a nice tool to be able to understand those individual differences. I feel sometimes we're too quick to go to a group mean and cancel out those individual differences. But what's exciting about sport, and we heard Angus talk about this yesterday, is the ability to profile and understand what's unique about each player so you can get the best out of them. Okay, so the next little clip is basically was done for television, so it's a little bit sensationalized but it will show you what it was like to do the perception action coupled. So in this case, the player is seeing the, the, the virtual character coming towards them, and they're trying to move to block them. Of course, they can't do a real tackle, but what they're doing is getting their body to the right place at the right time. That's virtual reality time. Sorry. Now it's time to test Tommy's ability to read deceptive movements. 
he will try and correctly read the movements of virtual opponents. The players he's up against are actually real French League players recorded and rendered as computer graphics. You're immersed in a virtual rugby pitch, okay. so you're not going to see any of the surroundings in here, but don't worry because we're not going to let you run into the wall, but what you'll see is basically a virtual player coming towards you, and they're going to try and sometimes they'll be making deceptive movements, sometimes they won't. Your goal is to stop them, to defend them. Okay? And what we'll be doing is we'll be measuring how and when you move in response to that player, okay? okay. I can't see any of the surroundings, so it's pretty much exactly like you see in a computer screen, so it's quite cool. Okay, now I want you to move your head left and right. <laughs> Up and down. Right, heading into the change room here. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> there we go. We'll keep you in the middle. Okay. Okay, ready? Tommy, let's go. Oh, he got me. <laughs> Damn it. Ready? Let's go. Yeah. Ian, half beat you there, I think. No chance. <laughs> let's go. Okay, so it gives you an idea of what you're doing there. Again, it's that acting in the moment. You're moving in response to what it is you see. So here, a bit like what we had for the soccer, the grey here is the perceptual bit. It's the attacker making a deceptive movement to the right, a deceptive movement to the left, and we've got our novice, the orange, and the purple is our expert. So again, you can see that difference in how or when and how they respond. So again, this is time. The experts waiting longer, and then they're going more directly to the attacker, so they're less fooled. Whereas you see this novice making that movement in the wrong direction, and what does it mean? There's a big gap that they can step around. So that decision-making process as a function of the information is very much impacting on the outcome. So just like what we saw before, the experts wait longer and more accurate, and the novices are using these deceptive signals, and that is what causing more error. This is just a bit of fun, but when you think about the implications of this, if you think of the all blacks with their all black um, outfits, there's no sort of visual cue that can draw your attention to this part, the center of mass, but if you're wearing fluorescent boots, you're drawing the eye down to one of those key deceptive signals. There's something to think about. Anyway, the last bit I'm conscious of time as well is trying to go a little bit further with this. I very much use this technology to understand behaviour. But I keep getting asked, okay Cathy, that's fine, but how do we take it to the next level? How can we actually use this? So when I started out, I was using headsets that cost 10,000 euro. I was using tracking systems that cost 60,000. So that is not going to be accessible for clubs or anything like that. Where's the opportunity? It's with the technology that we have to hand nowadays. So you've got HTC Vive, you've got a four by four space in which you can move around, a headset you can buy for like 500 pounds. Oculus as well, they're developing also a tracking system. So in other words, that perception action bit that you have, you can have that for a fraction of the price you could have before. The software as well now is great. It allows you to bring these things together much more easily than when I first started out. I started out with Cedric and we were coding line by line, our rectangular pitch, all of these things. Now with Unity and Unreal Engine, you can do so much. So this notion of perceptual training, or in my case, it's more about the decision making because I don't think you can separate out the two. This was an attempt by the ECB to really try to look at what it is you could do. So you've got obviously the bowler coming up, You've got the kinematics of the bowling action, and in behind this, you've got a ball launching machine. But the problem here is, A, the bowling kinematics don't correspond to what it is you see. The viewpoint is fixed, so there's no motion parallax. Those are pre-recorded events. That ball release point doesn't change, and in fact, that should vary with bowler height, and that actually determines distance. So you've got this disconnect between the information, the kinematics of the bowling action or those advanced cues and the outcome of the ball trajectory. So in other words, is this really something you should be training? What really are you training there? You're not attending to the relevant information necessarily. What they found was <coughs> players tend to focus on where the ball <coughs> is going to go. So Ash, my PhD student, um, who was mad about cricket, came uh, to the lab and basically said, can we not use VR for the cricket? 
So essentially what his project was about was looking at the possibilities of virtual reality and creating a virtual battling simulator. And one of the things that's very important is that fidelity of information. So we went down to the Australian Institute of Sport, captured some fast bowling actions, and we were able to get those animated with the resulting bowling or ball trajectory. So that was very important. What does it offer? It offers batters the opportunity to practice in a risk-free environment, take those risks with the shot. Angus talked yesterday about the, the um, pictures only playing so many games because you have to protect these people. Their bodies can't take all these deliveries. So how do, do you give your batter an opportunity to practice if your bowlers are trying to protect them from injury? Well, something like a batting simulator, they've used it in flight, they've used it in many different um, environments, gives you that opportunity to practice. So I suppose where we're going with this is we're having conversations. This is Ash's animations earlier. So you can see there is a bowler coming up, coming in and the player is able to respond in the moment. We're able to measure what the player does, what, when they do it, and how they do it. We're trying to improve the graphics, so this is some work with the ECB, this is a Lord Stadium. We're getting the bat in there, but we're also able to give augmented feedback. So you're able just immediately after the event, show players where the ball bounced, what the trajectory was. So you're able to do things in the virtual environment that you can't do in the real environment. And this James McCollum, one of the Cricket Ireland players, having that opportunity to give us some feedback in terms of the development of this technology. Finally, rugby. Again, there's huge opportunities to do things here. That ability to spot gaps. So some of Van der Correa's work was really around how do we spot gaps in defensive lines? What's the information that's important? So what we're trying to do, we've got players tell us you can never get enough decision making training. So that opportunity to act in the moment and also provide some instant feedback about what it is they do. So similar idea, head mounted display, simulate different scenarios and have the player respond to what it is they see and measure what their response is. So you can have them run with the ball, but you can also have it so that they pass the ball as well. So to date, we've been trying to play around with this with Ulster Rugby, looking at these opportunities to practice. Beginner level, please. <laughs> this is with some of the players who were injured at the time. Okay, left. Correct, well done. So they're getting feedback on what they do. No. Straight, Straight on. on. Yeah. So you saw it afterwards, didn't you? Yeah. So that was, for me, very interesting because that allowed us to understand that these players sometimes saw it late that, oh, I should have gone on. I shouldn't have done so. Level, I'll just mute <laughs> that. Um, thank you. Okay, now. Um, so players are turning from injury, if you think about it, action capabilities, they can't run around. But perceptually, you can give them that experience and give them that opportunity to make these decisions. One thing we did find with one of the players was these decision biases. And by that, we mean that the player kept making the same decision in the wrong direction even though the space was in the opposite place. Why? Because he wasn't, didn't feel comfortable passing the ball off his other hand. So that inability to execute a skill in a certain direction will limit your opportunities and what it is you do. And finally, what we're really trying to do is look at this ability to override, say, a wrong call, so your auditory information as well. So very quickly, in terms of the opportunity, where do I see it? Well, for me, this ability to profile players, to quantify their decision-making ability in some way, I think there's huge opportunity here. Identify decision biases and then personalize your training going forward. That notion of augmentation, adding to what you can currently do, so we saw a little bit with the cricket, adding some additional feedback that you can't do in everyday life, but also help players to attend that relevant information. Remember the honest signals and the deceptive signals, so if you can use visual cueing to get them to train their eyes, to point the eyes in the right place, could also help. And lastly, but not leastly, rehabilitation. So bringing these players back from injury, but also helping players to get into the zone in, in, in for example, cricket before you go out onto the crease. And then also minimizing injury risk to others. So you could run through lots of different plays, but you don't need another 10 players to do and simulate that type of environment. So 
I think, I hope I've shown you that immersive interactive VR technology can allow us to understand um, how information is influencing those decisions about action and how that really drives and underpins these action-based decisions around the what, when and how. And then lastly there, I hope that you can see there's potential here, massive potential, for us, I suppose, as psychologists, behavioural scientists, to take this into new sort of training applications that don't currently exist. But I suppose the, 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 the caution at the end is we need to be very careful about what it is we present within these scenarios and also what we're asking players to do so we don't end up training the wrong thing. Thank you very much for your attention. Very much, Kate. Wonderful talk. We have time for questions, so if you have one, please raise your hand. And if you have somebody with a microphone there, they are. Is there something? Yeah. Just give it. So I was speaking to the guy in there who was with Simi, um, who had uh, an HTC Vive with head, uh, eye tracking inside. So to date, we haven't been particularly interested in that. Why? Because when you've got a head tracker, you actually get information about where the head's pointing. So when the head's pointing over here, I'm looking over here, so my eyes are fixated on what's happening over there. I think the richness in terms of analysis, first of all, is around the head tracking movement. So I've got a PhD student looking at road crossing. So it's a two-lane traffic, so you've got that switching back and forth. So again, that head gaze back, forth, back, forth. You're going to get it first from the head movement. The eye movements, I don't think, are going to add much more into the analysis there. For a big screen, absolutely. But the fact that active perception piece comes from the head movement and you can track that, I would say the added value is quite limited for sporting scenarios. That, that's my opinion. Wouldn't be it the case that for gaze perception, deception, you look to the left, but actually you want to manipulate the opponent and then go to the right and look the other Yeah, so basically when you're immersed in this scenario, at the minute we've done the defender, so the defender is really focused on the attacker or mm. should be focused on the attacker. So they're really going to be looking there. But if you switch it around, you're, you know, yes, you're trying to go into full an avatar, so you could then at that point be doing some sort of eye movement. You could if you switched it around. I mean, it will have possibilities, but I'd say, first of all, there's so much information in the head movement um, before you would go to the eye movement. So, I mean, it will have value, but in a lot of these instances, no. Thanks, because yeah, here, one and two. Rita and Rita, so please choose. <laughs> Hi, thank you for your presentation, really nice one, Kathy. Um, I'd like to ask about children. Uh, can you use it with children from what age on? Because I know there's some limitations, but now we just talked about road crossing and I was really curious about it. Yeah, we did it with kids. Okay. <laughs> and what kids with autism as well. So um, they were using 10 to 12 year old kids, so we were looking at road crossing there. So yes, you can use it with them. I think the important thing with the kids is when you're trying to do this type of research that they don't think it's a game, that they try and still behave in the virtual world as they would in the real world. So what we had to introduce was a car with a horn so that if they made quite ridiculous decisions they got that feedback as well that they were going to have collision. But you can use it with them and interestingly there again that decision making piece, the detecting information, action capabilities and how that works. We looked at older adults as well. So what changes within that perception action piece there? Is it the ability to, to tune in to the right information? For older adults, it could be action capability. So how are those two coming together to influence that decision-making piece? And what we find with kids was there was one kid who was outstanding. He, was, he got everyone right. And my PhD student said to the mother, he's so good at this, does he play sport? She said he plays loads of sport. So I think even in some of these more simple tasks, there's this form of what I would call action intelligence. 
So that's that ability to make those right decisions. I think that comes through in early stages. I think as you see it in sport transfer from one sport to another, there's some people have that ability to tune into the information and act upon it in the right way. Hi, Kathy. Wonderful talk. Thank, Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering about a bit that you didn't talk during your talk, but beforehand, which is the how long does it take to for people to sort of calibrate to the virtual reality? Because <coughs> it's a very good point. Um, so for me, there still is that familiarization piece. It's not like you just put the headset on and away you go. We do let people put the headset on let them walk around. So at the start with the Tommy Bow video, we said, right, walk around, have a feel for this. So this ability to walk in the environment, the optic flow you get, then allows your body to calibrate to that. So you're controlling how the information is changing in the back of your eyes. So it's very important for the soccer as well, to so have them go over, touch the virtual posts or see where they are, reach up, down. So again, that familiarization is very important because it, it helps bring up this level of presence, because in VR environments it's about presence. That's one, then also then we need to come. Uh, Thank you for the great talk. Um, have you now tested enough rugby players to look at the, the, the ability of the tool, or the application of the tool in concussion and return to play, head trauma? That's an excellent point. Um, I haven't started this yet, but um, I think there's a massive opportunity there. So I was also in the US um, in September, and for college football, they're absolutely dying out for something that will allow you to have. So the idea is with Elster Abbey is to have the benchmark, the profile, um, how you perform, say, at the start of the season. You have a head injury, and then you're doing that return to play, doing those captures alongside. It's a project we have, but we haven't started collecting the data just yet, but it's an excellent point. And I think absolutely, this type of what, when, and how in this context will allow you to understand much more what type of head injury there is and whether the player's ready to get back onto the pitch again. But something I think definitely worth exploring. Adam. I am from Indonesia, madam. Okay, madam. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, to technology, uh, all spot, uh, spot Olympic, uh, can uh, all the traditional, uh, spot traditional. Sorry, could you repeat yeah. the question, please? I need to <coughs> address that a bit. So, uh, is this virtual technology can be used in traditional sports like uh, yes, like uh, other tra traditional sports like martial arts? Yes, sports. yes. I mean, again, I think as psychologists, behavioral scientists, we have to think about the application. So, if you look at my examples, they're very specific. The very specific aspects of the game. Some of my computer science colleagues want to just simulate for simulation's sake. I'm like, well, no, I think these have to be quite specific. But martial arts and boxing, so boxing was something that um, they came to speak to me in the lab about. So there you could train things like calibrating reach. So if you're up against an opponent who's got a longer reach in boxing, you can create an avatar who's got a longer reach. So you learn how to calibrate in terms of how close you can go before you can get hit. Again, it's about thinking about the application of that technology in a space. How does it add value and what it is you're trying to train? But I think there's potential to do this in lots of different spaces, but you have to be very specific about what it is you're trying to train. So whether it's calibration or whatever. Last question by Costas and then Thank you for a very well-structured presentation. Could you tell us whether there are any deleterious effects associated with long-term immersion and generally any tips on uh, code of conduct and best practice? Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. I remember when we would go through ethics, people didn't really ask me this, but we do our own risk assessment. Um, we don't have players immersed for, say, more than 10, 15 minutes. It is quite physical when you're in there, but we do like to give breaks every sort of 10 to 15 minutes and we wouldn't use it for more than an hour. The guidelines aren't very specific. They have it more around gameplay, but not necessarily in these types of applications. But I think it's something we're mindful of. 
players, if they don't particularly like it, then we just don't have them immersed in it. But we've had very few cases where somebody doesn't want to do it or doesn't get immersed in it. So it usually is, it is okay. So we have 10, 15 minutes break and then maybe no more than an hour. Thank you very much for the discussion. Please have a round of applause for Casey.